Shalom guys, welcome back to another episode here at Yashavi Ministries with Casa de Israel Yara. Thank you again for being here. Like I said always, if you like the content that we're putting up in our channel, like, subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, put them on the comment section down below. Also, share with any youth that is interested in getting to know the word of, of God and his truth and his context and his foundation. With that being said, let's get started with this week's Torah portion, this week's reading. Study, right? We're going to start a new book, right? The book of Exodus, right? Or its original name, which is uh, Shemot, right? Which is names, right? And it comes from the first uh, sentence of this week's Torah portion, which is the names of, right? The, the, the sons of Israel, right? That, that are in the land of Egypt. And so this week's Torah portion starts off... Uh, uh, after the death of Joseph, right, um, the generation that is left in Egypt by Joseph, and so uh, here the all the generation that was there before, um, all the brothers, right, all the the patriarchs, the leaders of each tribe or each uh, family, um, have passed away, and now it has become from a family into a nation, right, the nation of Israel. Right in Egypt, and so they encounter uh, a situation in which they are in the most fertile land that is in in Egypt, which is Goshim. Right, and I will put some pictures up so you can see. And so they have taken up this land, right, because of Joseph. Joseph gave him this land because he was a ruler; he was second in command, and so he put his family in the best land possible, right, which is close to. Uh, uh, Canaan, and so here uh, the people of Israel have become numerous, and then a Pharaoh who does not know Joseph comes up, right? And and that, that's something that we're gonna look at. And so this Pharaoh uh, sees how the Israelites have grown and how uh, how big and, and and numerous they are, and so he is fearful that they might turn against him and, and Egypt and overtake him, and so he starts putting rigorous labor on them. Right. And so they're not enslaved, but he puts hard labor on them and starts making them build uh, uh, monuments. Right. And, and, and work with bricks and stuff that the Israelites were not accustomed to because they are shepherds. Right. And so that's what Joseph called them to be and told them to call themselves because that will give them a, a, a space in which the Egyptians will not bother them because they are just shepherds. But because they were so numerous this pharaoh uh basically panicked and so he said uh i'm gonna make sure that they know he decided to establish and and make sure that they knew that he was the one in 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 leadership and so he started putting rigorous uh, uh hard labor on them and then eventually they kept growing and kept getting stronger and so he basically said that he wanted her, the midwives of the Hebrew women, right, when they were given labor, right, the male uh, kids, uh, the babies, were to be thrown into the Nile, and then they will keep the the, the daughters, right. But these midwives fear the the uh, the Lord, right? They fear Elohim, and so they did not do, and so they kept getting grow, uh, bigger and stronger, and so. Um, Pharaoh starts to basically uh, uh, kill uh, innocent babies um, just so that the Israelites will not overcome the Egyptians. Uh, and his fear of them taking over the land of Egypt and taking over power from him. And Moses uh, it comes into the picture, right? And so Moses in this chaos, right, this... this uh, basically genocide of babies right moses mother uh, puts him in the nile right is it believed that she put him in the nile to hide him from uh being killed uh and so she puts him in a basket puts him in the nile and so her hope is that he is saved or that he is uh kept away from harm and so the baby basket of moses flows and and and, and encounters uh pharaoh's uh daughters um uh 
while she's having a, a taking a bath in the Nile. Okay, and so that's where the story of Moses comes in, and this is where the Israelites are at right now in this uh, portion in this new book that we're going to be starting, which is very important because here is uh, where the foundation of Israel uh, of the faith is is established when it comes to why uh, Israel is who it is and why they are established as, as a nation and by whom they are established as a nation. And so we will learn that in this book and we will get to know the truth into what Elohim wants from us. And so we're going to start reading uh, on chapter one of the book of Shemot. It says, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. Uh, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judá. Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Neftali, Gad, Asher, and all the descendants of Jacob. Were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died. And all his brothers, all the generation, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly, and they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. So this is what we're talking about, right? So Joseph and the brothers die, and so the nation stays in Egypt, right? And so they're growing fruitful, they're multiplying, right? They're in the land of Goshen, right? And so this land is very fruitful, and 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 we will see. I'll put more pictures on, on the screen later on, and you will see how Goshen looks so much different to the other lands and, and and israel was powerful right you know in, in the movies and all these and in, in all these uh uh documentaries from and and tv shows that shows you know israel getting slaved and whipped but they were you know they were rich they were numerous they had land they had produce right because they were uh blessed by joseph and by elohim right through joseph and so um they were well kept and so that's why Pharaoh was uh, uh, so fearful of them. It says here, now there arose a new king over Egypt, right? Pharaoh, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal with surely with them unless they multiply. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set uh, task makers over them and afflicted them with heavy la uh, burdens. They built for Pharaoh's stores uh, cities, uh, uh, Pithom and Ramses. But they, uh, more they oppress. But the more they oppress, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they restlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field and all their work they wrestlingly made them work as slaves then the king of egypt said to the hebrew midwives one of whom was named sifra and other bois when you serve as midwives to hebrew women and see them on the birth stool if it is his son you shall kill him but if it's a daughter you shall live but the midwives feared elohim and did not do as the king of egypt commanded them but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Let the, the male children live. The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they gave birth before the midwife comes to them. So Elohim dealt with well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives fear Elohim, he gave them families Right? And Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Right. So here, Pharaoh is uh, desperately trying to take control of the situation. Right. But remember, this all comes from Pharaoh assuming that the Israelites will grow in number and that if there is a war, then they will overcome them. And if that happens, then they will take over the land. And so there's a lot of ifs and buts in this, in, in the uh, Pharaoh's uh, analyzation of what could happen, right? The Hebrews were just living in Egypt. Now, 
just is very interesting because Israel was not supposed to stay in Egypt, right? They settled in Egypt and they were living in Egypt and they were growing numerous in Egypt and they were assimilating with Egyptian culture, right? Their responsibility was to be in Egypt, right? Until the famine was over. And then they should have gone back to the land, right? But no, they stayed in Egypt and they assimilated, right? So it goes both ways, right? The, the, the Egyptians or the Pharaoh, by assuming he started to um, oppress the people, right, unjustly. And so he had uh, activated a, 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 a reason for Elohim to interfere, right? And so... We're going to keep seeing that in chapter uh, 2, right? So this is the birth of Moses. So this is the birth of Moses, right? It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months, right? So, so Moses was hidden for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him in a basket and made uh, of bushless and end up with his uh, 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 bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done of him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, while your, your while her young woman while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw a child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from Hebrew woman to nurse a child for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Right, so here the sister of Moses right, approaches pharaoh's uh, daughter and tells us should i call a nurse right and so she says yes she calls a nurse what in reality the sister calls her mother right so this is moses sister she calls her mother and her mother is the one that is the nurse for moses right and so then it comes to pass in chapter uh verse 11 says one day when moses had grown up he went out of to his people and looked on on their burdens and saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in, in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Right? So this is the altercation that Moses is having, right? He defends his brothers. Or, uh, and then he is encountered with having to bury the body and hide this decision that he had made uh, wrongfully by killing a man. And now his brothers are fighting and he is uh, casting a, a set of judgment between them. And they say, who are you to judge me? And they said, do you mean to kill us as you killed the Egyptian? Right. So somebody saw them. And so Moses was afraid and thought. Surely the, the thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he stayed down by a well. Now the priest of Midian has seven daughters. And they came to draw water and fill the, uh, the uh, throats to water with uh, to water their flocks. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and, the water their, and watered their flocks. When they came home, their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherd and even drew water for us and water the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? When you have left the man, call him that he may eat and bread. Right. So this is a covenantal meal. Right. It says, And Moses was cont content to dwell with them. And with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Sephora. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Get a son. For he said, I have been sojourner in a foreign land. Right? It says, God hears Israel's groaning. Right? During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. 
their cry for for rescue from slavery came up to Elohim, and Elohim heard it. And remember his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Elohim saw the people of Israel, and Elohim knew. So here, Moses, right, is already out of Egypt. He flees out of fear that obviously uh, Pharaoh is going to kill him. And so he is found, found in the land of Midian in a well. He defends uh, the daughters of Ruel, and Ruel uh, brings him in. Gives him bread, and then he provides him of uh, one of his daughters as a wife. And now Moses has made himself into a shepherd, right, uh, and has gone out of his land, right, which has become Egypt, right? Because when they saw it, Joseph, he was an Egyptian. They saw an Egyptian saved us, right? And now Moses has totally changed who he is. And he has become a stranger, right, a sojourner in a new land, right? And so he has kind of found himself, right? And he has identified himself with his people. And now Elohim, once seeing this uh, uh, change in Moses, he hears the cry of Israel, right? The people and remembers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so it's interesting because Moses is thrown into the now. And so I have the Sunder Van Illustrated Bible uh, commentary. And it's interesting because it says, uh, uh, verse uh, 22, right? It says that uh, he was thrown into the Nile, right? It says the Nile uh, was the longest river in the world, was the most important physical feature in ancient Egypt, right? Uh, the rainy season caused the river to overflow its banks and spill into much of the land every summer. This deposited federal sediment on the fertile so that after the flooding, farmers had remarkably rich soil for their crops. This yearly inundation assured the Egyptians that they and their land would be uh, prosperous. The Nile was their most precious gift from the gods. Ironically, the Pharaoh in Exodus uses this river uh, for the guarantee of the Egyptian fer fertility in an attempt to squelch the fertility of the Hebrews, right? So basically the Nile represented uh, fertility, right? Once it rained and it overflowed, the soil will be uh, ready to yield crop. And so that's where everything or life came from, right? Uh, provision for the, for the land of Egypt came from the Nile, right? Depending on, on the Nile providing water, for the crops uh, depended on what if they had food or if they had harvest. And so uh, the, the fertility of the Nile was important. It was given by the gods. And the Nile was represented too as a god, right? They, they believed in that the, the, the waters, right, was a, a god called Nun, right? And so their fertility came from the water, right? And so where their most prosperous life came from, which was the Nile, he was using that uh, a power, which they believe was a god, and he was casting the Hebrew babies into judgment in the in the Nile, and so that that was a way of judging um, if they wanted to find uh, an offense, uh, a man or whatever. Right? They would cast the bodies uh, into the into the uh nile and if they survived then they will survive the judgment and so what they started doing is that they would tie their hands and their feet and so they will throw them in the nile and so if they did not survive right but they were tied then they had been judged righteously and they died by the by the nile okay and so this is what's going on with the babies right the babies are thrown in the water and so they're not found just to live because the Nile God or the or, the, or, or noon was not approving uh, of these child. And so when Moses is delivered, right, and it's it, Moses' story is, is not much different. There's many different stories of uh, a child that is abandoned in a way, or right? was given, and then he is left. He is found, and then he grows and, and becomes powerful, right? So Moses. In a sense, his story brings out a special touch to this, uh, um, the story of the Exodus or the book of Shemot. And so when Moses enters Midian, right, Midian uh, 
Uh, the area is probably located in northeastern Arabia, just to the east of the Gulf of Elat. Uh, this area ra raises an interesting possibility when one considers that it is here where Moses, for the first time, encounters Elohim, right? And that's what we're going to encounter in chapter 3, right? So let's go. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. Interesting, right? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burning. Yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will, not, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called to him out of the bush and Moses and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. Place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he, for he was afraid to look at Elohim. And the Lord said to him, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians, to bring them up that I, to the land, to a good land, broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, Moses object, objects to Elohim. But before he objects to Elohim, it's interesting because it says here that, it says here, right, verse uh, 4 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses from within the bush. Okay? Now we read that Elohim speaks to Moses from within the bush. So who exactly is in the bush? It was not unusual for ancient Near Eastern deities to be thought of ascending angels or in its original definition, messengers. For instance, in the Babylonian story of Nergal and Erishkal, the god Kaka is a, the messenger of, of the god Anu, who sends Kaka to carry the message to Erishkal, queen of the underworld. Typically, such messengers were gods or goddesses in the service of superior deities. One theory is that for the ancient Israelites, messengers from God were indeed celestial beings. Because of ancient Israel's monotheism, however, these beings could not be separated gods. And there was thus some merging between the identities of the messengers and the identities of God. The former were not God, but could become God, possessed in a way by him and be referred to as Elohim, as happens here. Another theory is that scribes involved in copying biblical texts inserted the word angel, right, or messenger in some passages to make the passages more theologically uh, palatable. With respect to these verses, the reasoning may have been this. Elohim for them was not to be seen by humans, except in extraordinary circumstances. It was almost unimaginable to them that Elohim would have appeared to Moses. Speaking in, as it, speaking is one thing, appearing is another. According to this view, then it must be a messenger and not Elohim himself who actually formed a visible entity that captures Moses' attention. So, basically, in the ancient Near Eastern, it was normal to send a royal messenger, a messenger of, right? The king will send a messenger that represented the king. And that messenger was basically the king, right? And so Elohim, right, is the king, right? And so 
he has sent a messenger, right? So the, the, the angel of Elohim or the messenger of Elohim that is speaking through the bush is a messenger that represents Elohim, right? And so Elohim is telling Moses that Moses will become the messenger of Elohim, okay? And he will represent Elohim. So as Moses speaks, Elohim speaks, right? And so Pharaoh had a vassal. And so when that vassal spoke, it was like as Pharaoh spoke, okay? So it's a common practice in the ancient Near Eastern context of the biblical story and narrative, right? We have to understand because we're going to see this, right? Yeshua is believed to be a messenger. Now, Yeshua is not just a messenger. He's not simply just a messenger. He's not simply just a man. Yeshua is not common, right? Yeshua has a divinity. But Yeshua's purpose was to bring a message on behalf of the king. Okay? So, Moses is called to do this. Right, and so we're gonna see Moses' answer. But Moses said to Elohim, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, But I will be with you, and he shall be the sign of you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve Elohim on this mountain. Then Moses said to Elohim, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is, this, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Elohim said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, this definition is interesting because in the Hebrew, right, it says, Aye Asher Aye, right? It says most translators render the biblical phrase Aye Asher Aye as I will be as I will be to imply uh, uh, I will be with them in the dif difficulty and I will be with them in their other servitudes. However, our Targumas regards the three words as God's name. He also retains the Hebrew word Hey. At the end of the verse, as Elohim's name without translating it into Aramaic. Right, so the name in its sense name means the one who is from the beginning, right? So Elohim is saying, when they ask you who sent you, he is basically saying the creator. Right? And how would they know this? Because remember, Abraham understood who Elohim was and it came down from Set, right? Noah, right? All the demands of Elohim have preserved the story and the history of Elohim and the people. And so the people, even in their oppression, have known who their Elohim is. They just have assimilated with the Egyptians. But when they know that the one who was sent, right, and and in 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 the, in the Hebrew, the name of Elohim is uh, hidden, right, into what he's saying, right. And he said, "Say this to the people of Israel: I am has sent me to you." Elohim also said to Moses, "Say this to the people of Israel: The Lord, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever." And thus, I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Uh, go and gather the, the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord Elohim your, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, happened, uh, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. I promise that I will bring you up and out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of a Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hebuzite. And the land flowing with milk and honey, and they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord your Elohim. But now that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by the mighty hand. So I will stretch my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders. And I will do in it 
After that, he will let you go, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold and jewelry. For clothing, you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so that you shall plunder the Egyptians. Then Moses answered, Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is it at your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put it out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and became a staff in his hands, that they may be believe that the Lord, the Elohim of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside of your cloak. And he put his hand inside the cloak. And he, when he took it out, behold, his hands was leprous, like snow. Then Elohim said, Put your hand back inside your coat. And he put his hand back inside his coat. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like it was the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, Elohim said, or listen to the first sign, they will believe the later sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow in speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore I will be with you, and with your mouth, and teach you and what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is it not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I now... That he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put his words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth, with his mouth. And I will teach you both what to do. And he shall speak for you to the people. And he shall be your mouth. And you shall be Elohim's Elohim to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. So now Moses has been going back and forth with Elohim. Elohim has basically established Moses' purpose. Right? Moses is supposed to be the messenger of Elohim. Right? And Mo Moses doesn't feel he is adequately prepared to be that. Right? It says here that he had a de de uh, deficiency in speech. Or slow in speaking or in tongue. Uh, it is it's understood that he was more of a, a, he was rude, not rude, he was rough. How he expressed himself was el not eloquent enough to bring a peaceful confrontation uh, with Pharaoh. So that's why but Aaron will be more of a peaceful maker, or, or Aaron will bring a peaceful approach to what Elohim is, uh, the message that Elohim is trying to send, okay? So, it says here, it says, Moses returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. It's interesting because he asked for permission from Jethro, and Elohim sent him to fulfill this mission. So, it shows the respectfulness and uh, hierarchy that is presented in, 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 in this culture, right? He Even it, when Elohim told him... Um, to go and fulfill this mission, and he argued with Elohim, um, he asked for permission for Jethro so that he can go and fulfill his duty. And Jethro said to him, Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses and his wife and his sons and, uh, and had them ride in a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of the Lord in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, See that you you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. 
then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord Israel, Is my firstborn son, and I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. A law at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Sephora took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it, with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. And it was then that she said, The bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision and the lord said to aaron and the lord said to aaron go into the wilderness and meet moses so went so he went and met him in the mountain of elohim and kissed him and moses told aaron all the words that the lord had had told him and uh, sent to speak and all the signs that he had com commanded him to do then moses and aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of israel and aaron spoke to all the words of the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people and the people believed. And when they heard the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Right. And so here Moses uh, eventually fulfills his duty when it comes to going. Right. And so here. You, we see that there is a minor altercation with uh, Elohim, right? And then Moses is, is, is almost being killed because his his sons, right, have not been circumcised, which is part of the covenant. And so Elohim has chosen Moses, and Moses um, was hadn't fulfilled his, his uh, side of uh, the pact, which was circumcising his, his sons. And so by Sephora doing that, she has saved Moses' life and relieved him from that uh, altercation with Elohim. Now, it says here that Elohim will harden uh, Pharaoh's heart. Now, as we go on through the story, we will understand what, the, uh, what does that mean, right? But right now, we're going to stop here before chapter 5, right? The Torah portion is till chapter 6. Um, but we're going to learn a little bit from Moses to close out, right? So Moses has been chosen by Elohim. He's a messenger, right? As a messenger to portray Elohim's message and to represent him in front of Israel, right? Moses is chosen to fulfill Elohim's work, right? And so eventually we'll get to know Moses and why he is the one that's chosen, right? Because he, he's humble, right? He's a humble servant. He did not choose it. Elohim chose him. He's not seeking any particular favor. He's just fulfilling the will, the will of Elohim, okay? And so Moses here is going to encounter Pharaoh, right? And so... It's going to be a, a, a confrontation between gods, right? Pharaoh, the God, and Elohim, right? Through Moses. And this is the, 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 the amazing part about this, that Pharaoh is not seeing Moses because he doesn't, he, he, he's not seeing Elohim because he doesn't understand that concept. He's seeing Moses as the God, right? And so that is how Pharaoh's heart is hardened because Pharaoh cannot control what Moses is about to fulfill but pharaoh doesn't understand that it is not moses that is doing it is elohim that is sending moses but pharaoh cannot see that and he will not see that and that's how his heart starts to harden so with that being said this book is going to give us the heart of elohim giving us the purpose of israel uh the house is going to give us a lot uh and what is interesting is that the start of this book uh, demonstrates that the chosen one in this part, which is Moses, humbly did not want to be the one, but eventually relinquished that and said that he was going to fulfill it, right? He did it with honor and with grace. And so Aaron himself did it the same. There's a structure, there's a hierarchy. Um, Moses, right, uh, demonstrates us this, right? We see Elohim, 
the messenger Elohim, Moses, Aaron, Israel. Um, and that is what the foundation of the Bible itself is. Elohim, the messenger of Elohim, Moses, and Aaron. And so we will be learning more uh, on this uh, book of Exodus. And I hope that uh, in this week's reading, a little bit of a study, a little bit of information that we had, you will learn some different, some new. Uh, hope you guys have a great week. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.